Our text uh, this morning is Luke chapter 12, uh, verses 13 through 21, in which um, our Lord gives a parable in light of a situation in which a man was concerned about whether he would get more of of the world's goods and wanted Jesus to help him do that by arbitrating, as it were, between him and his brother for the family inheritance. Jesus gives a parable about a rich man who had lots of riches, wanted to build bigger buildings to house all those riches and just kind of take it easy, but didn't realize his life that night was going to be uh, required of him, and he wasn't going to be able to enjoy those goods, and neither was he going to enjoy anything because he hadn't prepared. He hadn't trusted in the Lord. He hadn't lived for His glory, and so now he had to face the consequences. Well, let's read about this in Luke 12, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, "'Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me.' But he said to him, "'Man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you?' Then he said to them, that is to his disciples, "'Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed.'" For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, You have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Well, again, I hope this brings out the importance of looking beyond this life to eternity and making sure you're ready and making sure that you're storing up treasures there and not simply here where you're going to have to leave them all behind uh, when you die. May the Lord impress this on our hearts this morning. Now, again, as Jesus was speaking to His disciples about the very real costs of of, of discipleship, of basically following Him, Someone in the crowd tried to enlist his help to get his brother to divide the family inheritance with him. Well, Jesus first pointed out that that wasn't his responsibility. You know, nobody appointed him as a judge or an arbitrator over them. They would either have to find one or work that out for themselves. But then Jesus used this encounter as an object lesson for his disciples uh, to teach them to be on their guard against greed, every form of it. How much they had of the world's goods really doesn't matter because it couldn't give them that which was most important, and that is eternal life. It couldn't save their souls. Now, to further illustrate this, he told them a parable of a rich man whose land was producing so much that he didn't have a place to uh, put it all. But instead of putting it to good use, you might say, such as sharing it with those who were less fortunate, he decided that he would keep it. He made plans to tear down his existing barns and build larger ones to store his goods. And with so many goods now to sustain him, he could take his rest and rest easy for many years. Basically, to put it in modern-day terms, he had done very well for himself in his vocation, and he was looking forward to an early retirement, and he thought it would be a a secure retirement. Now, what's wrong with that? I mean, isn't that kind of what we're all doing? Well, his problem was he hadn't taken care of what was most important, and that is his soul. Before he could build his larger barns, before he could store up his goods, before he could take it easy... He was going to die, and he wasn't ready to die. Now somebody else was going to enjoy his retirement plan that he had stored up for himself while he was going to go down into hell where he would suffer forever. It's no wonder God called him a fool. 
Now, Jesus said to His disciples, as He also says to each one of us here this morning, so is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. It doesn't matter how successful you are in this life if you don't turn from your sins and trust in Jesus Christ, if you don't serve Him with your life in this world, ultimately you too are a fool. Now, I think this highlights, I hope it highlights for us, the importance of having an eternal perspective, of looking beyond the here and now to consider how the decisions you make in this life are going to affect you and other people in eternity, which is far more important. So that's what I would like for us to consider this morning, two things that you need to look ahead for your own well-being, and you also need to look ahead for the well-being of others. Now, first of all, you need to look ahead for your own well-being. I think if you know anything about the Bible, if you know anything about what the Lord teaches, if you know anything about eternal life, you realize life does not end when you leave this world. It continues. You are going to live. You are going to exist forever. As a matter of fact, everybody you've ever known, everybody you ever will know that has even already departed from this world have not ceased to exist. They are all still very much alive. And the same thing is going to be true of you. Your life here is merely the beginning of an endless existence. You didn't exist eternally in the past. You did come into being sometime in time. But from the time you came into this world, your life, your existence is going to go on endlessly. Now, Jesus knew this was true. Of course, Jesus did, which is why He often talked about the future and what it was that was going to happen to Him after this life. You might say Jesus had an eternal perspective. He knew that after He died, He was going to be raised again from the dead. He said to the Jews in John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it took 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. But He was speaking of the temple of His body. Jesus knew when He died He was going to be raised. He knew that after He was raised, He would ascend again into heaven. Now, when His, you might say, a larger group of people, disciples, were following Him, uh, that were following Him, complained after He told them that they needed to eat His flesh and drink His blood to receive eternal life, which of course we know Jesus did not mean literally but spiritually, that we need to feed upon Him by faith, by trusting in Him, He said this, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where He was before? Well, Jesus knew that after He died, He was going to be raised from the dead. He knew that after He was raised from the dead, He was going to ascend into heaven. Jesus was looking forward. He knew that after He ascended, He would sit at the right hand of God to rule and to reign there as the Lord of all creation. He said to the elders of Israel when He was on trial, but from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of God or at the right hand of the power of God, which means He would have the place of honor and authority as King of kings and of Lord of lords, okay? Jesus was looking forward. He knew that there was a day coming in which He would judge all men at the final judgment. He said to the Jews, for not even the Father judges anyone, but He has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. And He said to His disciples, but when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. And you know, then takes, takes place the final judgment. Jesus knew he would be seated on that throne and that he would judge all nations. And he also knew that he was going to enjoy the blessings of heaven with his own redeemed people throughout, uh, really throughout all eternity. 
He prayed in his high priestly prayer, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. Now you see, this, this perspective that Jesus had, this view that he had, that this wasn't all that there was, that there was a heaven, that there was a reward, that there was glory to be gained, that there was a Father to be honored, an eternity to prepare for His people. It, it helped shape everything that Jesus did while He was in this world. This was the time to work so that He might enter into His rest. Rest was coming later. This was the time in which to humble Himself that He might be exalted when His work was done. This was the time to suffer in order that He might gain the reward. Jesus did not work to store up treasures on earth. He lived to gain treasures in heaven. And the question, of course, that this asks you this morning is, do you have that same perspective? Are you living for the life that is coming, or are you living only for this life? Now, what kind of a difference should this make? Well, the first difference it should make is that you, if you're living for the life that is to come, the first thing you're going to do is make sure that your soul is safe. You won't make the same mistake that the rich man made, setting your eyes on the things of the world and neglecting your soul. You'll make sure your soul is secure by turning from your sins and by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ you'll realize that, that God's not going to accept you as you are because you are not good enough. You have sinned against Him. You need a payment for that sin. You can't pay it because the debt is infinite. You sinned against an infinitely holy God. And so you will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that He has provided. You'll trust in Him to pay for your sins. Jesus provided not only, well, He provided an infinite payment on the cross to take care of your sins. You will trust in His obedience. I mean, the Lord requires that you obey Him perfectly throughout life and do everything perfectly, but you've done everything imperfectly. So you will trust in Jesus' perfect obedience for your righteousness to make you acceptable to the Father. The first thing you'll do is you'll make sure you've taken care of that which is most important and that is the eternal security of your soul. You'll make sure that you're safe, unlike the rich man. But you'll also avoid the other mistake the rich man made, which, of course, he couldn't have done unless he had done the first thing, which is to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You won't make the mistake of thinking that the things of this world are valuable, and so you won't spend your life working for them and try to get as much as you can. Rather, you will work for the things that really do have value. I want you to listen to a quote from John Gerstner. I haven't actually quoted Gerstner for quite some time, but he was one of my favorite 20th century theologians, somebody who was actually R.C. Sproul's mentor, and this man being a student of Jonathan Edwards, and he quotes Jonathan Edwards, which is one of the reasons why I'm quoting him this morning. And you've heard this quote before, but I want you to listen carefully to it. Edwards was not just a genius, he was a a saved genius. He was a sanctified genius. He lived his life for the glory of God. And why did he do that? It's because he had an eternal perspective. Now, listen to what Gerstner says in his book on the theology of Jonathan Edwards. He says this, today in America, a man's worth refers to his financial assets. But Edwards preached that, quote, this life is so short and so inconsiderable that it is no matter who prospers here and who does not. The only thing worth considering is who it is who prospers in an eternal state. I, I hope you got that because that really sums up, I mean, a very important teaching in Scripture. Life is short. It doesn't matter who prospers below. Eternity goes on forever. What really matters, the only thing worth considering 
is who prospers in an eternal state. Close quote for Edwards. Gerstner continues, God commonly gives this world's things to the wicked because God knows that they are worthless and despises them. Why do the wicked prosper? It's because God gives them things that are worthless and that He despises. Now think about this for a minute. How long are you actually going to be here in this world? I know some of the children, you know, who, who really haven't uh, lived that long and are young adults. You think life just goes on. You think that the rest of your life is going to seem as long as the first part of your life, but it isn't so. We read in our psalm this morning, 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. We do know some people make it 90. Some make it to 100 and 100 plus. Not very many. Not very many. But how long are you going to live in the eternal state? 70? 80? 90? 100 trillion years? No, actually it's far longer than that. You can't even begin to number the years that you are going to exist after this world. Now, do you realize that what you do for the Lord here in this brief period of time is going to have a direct impact on how you prosper there. As a matter of fact, only what you do here is going to have an impact on what it's going to be like there. Do you take that into account in your decision-making processes? When you're making choices, do you make choices in light of eternity? Now, you realize that when you plan out your day, when you plan out your week, when you plan out your year, you're looking ahead and you're basically budgeting your time. When you make a financial budget, you know, when you plan for retirement, you're basically looking ahead over the month, over the year, you're looking over your life and you're trying to figure out whether you're going to have enough to make it to the end of your life. You're looking ahead and you're planning. But how often do you look ahead and plan with regard to eternity? The rich man didn't. And look at what it cost him. It cost him everything he had. It cost him his soul. It cost him an eternity of suffering. Jesus did look ahead and look at what he gained. He gained glory. He gained honor. He gained reward. Think about what you're doing with your life. Are you living with an eternal perspective? Think about the vocation that you're in or maybe the one that you're preparing for or hoping that you're going to go in. Is that something that will glorify God? If you're in a vocation right now, are you working for the glory of God? Think about how you're using your time in light of eternity, your strength, your energy, your spiritual gifts, your natural talents, the resources that God has placed at your disposal. Are you investing yourself in the kingdom of God in the light of eternity so that you can reap eternal blessings? Or are you investing yourself merely in this world, in this life only? You need to realize whatever you invest in this life only is all going to be lost when you leave here. Only the things you invest in the kingdom of heaven are the things you're going to be able to hold on to. So think about what you're doing with eternity in view and let this shape your life. Let it begin to move you in the direction the Lord would have you to go, doing all that you do here for God's glory. I mean, now, the Lord isn't saying, you know, again, give up your job, give up everything, give up your possessions and go out on the street. But what He is saying, again, see all that you have as a stewardship entrusted to you. See all that He has given to you, every opportunity, even your work as an opportunity to serve Him and serve Him in it glorify Him in it, help other people for the glory of God. Do all that you do, basically as Paul exhorts you in 1 Corinthians 10.31. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Because when you do it for His glory, you actually not only honor Him, but you get to keep it. Whatever you do for yourself, whatever you do purely for yourself in this world, all of that is going to be lost. So this is how you prosper in an eternal state, is by doing all that you do for the glory of God. But you have to have that perspective 
if you're going to do that, if you're going to make choices with, with that in view. Think about the long term. Don't just think about the short haul. Now, one very good way to do this, and this brings us to the second point, is by looking ahead for the well-being of others. And I don't think I need to spend much time on this. I mean, Jesus looked ahead to the glory and the honor that was going to be His. But how is it that Jesus would gain it? Not by serving Himself, but by serving others, by laying down His life for His people. On one occasion, the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus and said, Jesus, grant that my two sons in your kingdom may sit one on your left hand, one on your right. And of course, the other disciples, when they heard that, they got upset. Jesus said this, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. Now, Jesus lived for others. He didn't live for Himself. He lived as a servant. There's a sense in which Jesus lived His entire life, we might say, vicariously, which means not for Himself, but for you. He lived for you as a servant to you and to all who would basically put their trust in Him. He lived as your representative. He lived for your benefit. That's also why He laid down His life for you on the cross if you're trusting in Him this morning. But remember, Jesus didn't do that just to benefit you. He did that to be an example to you of how you are to live. Jesus said to His disciples, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Jesus laid down His life for you, and He tells you that you are to love others by laying down your life for them. So as you look ahead to what the eternal state holds for you, think about what Jesus calls you to do for one another, how you are to love one another, how you are to serve one another, care for one another, build each other up in Jesus Christ, try to outdo one another in showing honor to one another, not trying to get honor from one another. And as you do these things, basically you make the eternal state that much better. It's not going to be the same for all. I mean, everyone who is there, in, in, uh, who is trusted in Christ and who is with the Lord in the new heavens and the new earth is going to be fully blessed, but there are going to be some who are going to be blessed more than others. And so as you give yourself to glorify the Lord, you make things better. As you look ahead, think about serving one another. But secondly, as you look ahead, don't forget about your neighbors who are still in darkness, who are ignorant of the gospel. I mean, there are reasons why people aren't saved. One, one reason is they know the gospel and they hate it and they're not going to receive Christ. Well, only God can change their heart. But another reason is they haven't heard the gospel. They still need to hear it. There's lots of people who do not know what it is. Think about them. Think about what's going to happen to them if they don't hear the gospel. Think about what's going to happen if they don't repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to suffer in hell for all eternity like the rich man who did not prepare himself for death. Think about what you can do to save them from that fire. You can share the gospel with them. And again, there's a variety of ways you can do that one-on-one. -on -one. Building relationships is the best way to do it, but certainly inviting people to come to church, inviting people to come to the movie nights, that's another way you can do it. When you do that, not only is, the very, is there a very real possibility that God's going to save them, but you're going to be able to look forward to an even better situation in eternity just for making the effort. 
You see, the Lord doesn't reward you based upon the results of your service. He rewards you on the basis of your service. The results are entirely in His hands. So all you have to do is make the attempt, and God will reward you for it. Well, I hope you get some idea of how an eternal perspective helps to shape your decision-making processes as far as what it is you're going to choose to do, what you're going to choose not to do. I mean, this is also very powerful in helping us resist sin. If I'm being tempted by sin, think about if I make this choice, you know, I might get some kind of gratification here for a moment, but what's it going to mean in the light of eternity? Grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit, having to, to recover from that sin, having to get back on my feet and get into a position where I can again serve the Lord and begin to stir, you know, store up treasures in heaven. We need an eternal perspective. So may the Lord help us to be able to live in the light of eternity. May He give us that perspective that we need to see things as they really are and to do the things that are most important. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us uh, do that.